Today we're coming to the end of our series on the parable of the prodigal son, which is perhaps better named the parable of the waiting father or the loving father. And as we know, it's the story that Jesus told about God and about us. A parable about a father who has two sons, who as it turns out are both equally lost, one of whom most obviously so by requesting his share of the father's inheritance, which is a way of saying to the father, of course, I wish you were dead, and running off, spending all the money, but then realizing just how lost he is and coming home, but never, never really expecting the kind of welcome, the kind of warm, loving welcome he receives. And the other son, of course, who stays home, who does all the right things, but is equally lost because he thinks that's what he has to do to be accepted by his father, to be loved by his father, to do what he's told, to do all, all the right things, to follow all the rules. So he has earned his love, and his father, of course, loves the fact that his son has stayed home, loves the fact that his son does all the good things that he asks him to do. And yet the father despairs because that son, too, does not realize, does not realize why it is the father loves him. And so we read now, today, the story of the father. We're looking at the story from the perspective of the father. And we're reading the words that the father speaks to each of these two sons. First, to the younger son, upon his return. The father said to the slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead. He's alive again. He was lost. He was found. And they began to celebrate. And then the words of the father to the older son who is not yet ready to come to the party, who's not yet ready to accept the fact that his father has reached out in a loving embrace to welcome his younger brother home. And the father says this to the older son, also words of blessing. Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life, was lost, and has been found. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Some of you have read the book by Henry Nouwen, who is one of the great spiritual teachers of our time. Henry now in a Dutch uh, theologian and teacher of pastoral care who, uh, who wrote many classic books, but one is on the return of the prodigal, which is a meditation on the parable of Jesus, on the prodigal son, but it's also a meditation on that painting by Rembrandt, the prodigal son. It's actually a portion of it's hanging by the entrance there. Um, but now he looks at the parable and experiences it in three ways. Experiences it as a younger son. Because who among us has not strayed from home and felt lost and far away? Spiritually, if not physically. Who among us does not need to hear the words of acceptance of unconditional grace from the loving Father when we return home? So we hear the story as the younger son, but we also, he says, hear it as an older son, because who among us who among us is not trapped in this cycle of our worth is determined by others? Our worth is determined by what we do, by how much we produce. Because for many of us, that's the way we are measured and counted and evaluated is by how much we do. And that older brother did not realize that he liked the younger brother. Like the younger brother was loved for who he is, not for what he does. And so who now and said does not also need to hear that word of grace, that we are, we are loved just for who we are. But at the end of his book, now makes a rather bold statement. He says, not only are we the elder son and the younger son, we are also called to be the father. We 
You're also called to be the father. To be the one who welcomes home. To be the one who offers the words of forgiveness and grace. To be the one who lets others know that who you are is not, your worth is not something that's measured and counted. But your worth as a human being comes to us merely because you are a precious soul in the eyes of God. Which saint was it that said, God has no, no words but our words. God has no arms but our arms, no hands but ours, no voice but ours, no heart but ours to use in the world. And so we are all called to be the Father, to offer the grace of blessing to one another. Now I was asked uh, what it means to pronounce a blessing, and he, he said this, to give someone a blessing is the most significant affirmation we can offer. It is more than a word of praise or appreciation. It is more than pointing out someone's talents or good deeds. It is more than putting someone in the light. To give a blessing is to affirm, to say yes, to a person's belovedness. To give a blessing is to affirm a person's belovedness. Rachel Naomi Riemann is a physician and, uh, who founded a new calling, uh, or an additional calling, I should say, the healing not just of bodies, but the healing of souls. And she's written a number of books that are right on the border between spirituality and medicine, and because for her there is no border, they're all one. And she writes of how this started for her. She was born to two parents who were children of their time, uh, very much you believe in what you can see. Uh, science is the ultimate uh, measure of truth. But she had a grandfather, a grandfather who was a rabbi. And she writes this about her grandfather. On Friday afternoons when I would arrive at my grandfather's house after school, the tea would already be set on the kitchen table. And after we had finished our tea, my grandfather would set two candles on the table and light them. Then he would have a word with God in Hebrew. I would be able to do that, to have a word with God in Hebrew. <laughs> Sometimes he would speak out loud, but often he would close his eyes and be quiet. I knew then that he was talking to God in his heart. You don't have to know Hebrew to talk to God in your heart. I would sit and wait patiently because the best part of the week was coming. When Grandpa finished talking to God, he would turn to me and say, Come, Miss Shumile. And then I would stand in front of him, and he would rest his hands lightly on the top of my head. He would begin by thanking God for me and for making him my grandpa. He would specifically mention my struggles during that week and tell God something about me that was true. Each week, I would wait to find out what that was. If I had made mistakes during the week, he would mention my honesty in telling the truth. If I had failed, he would appreciate how hard I had tried. If I had taken even a short nap without my nightlight, he would celebrate my bravery in sleeping in the dark. Then he would give me his blessing and ask the long ago women I knew from his many stories, Sarah, Rachel, Rebecca, Leah, to watch over me. Those few moments were the only time in my week when I felt completely safe and at rest. My family of physicians and health professionals were always struggling to learn more and to be more. It seemed there was always more to know. It was never enough. If I brought home a 98 on a test from school, my father would ask, and what happened to the other two points? <laughs> I pursued those two points relentlessly throughout my childhood, but my grandfather did not care about such things. For him, I was already enough. And somehow, when I was with him, I knew with absolute certainty that this was so. My grandfather died when I was seven years old. I had never lived in a world without him in it before, and it was hard for me. He had looked at me as no one else and called me by a special name, Nishumile, 
which means beloved little soul. Beloved little soul. There was no one less left to call me this anymore. At first I was afraid that without him to see me and tell God who I was, I might disappear. But slowly over time, I came to understand that in some mysterious way, I had learned to see myself through his eyes. And that once blessed, we are blessed forever. What a gift. What a gift. What a gift to give a child. Now, you know, we who are parents, sometimes, you know, that unconditional love that you are a precious, beloved soul, that gets hard because we also have to teach them things. We have to make sure they do their homework and all that. But nonetheless, nonetheless, what a goal that each of our children each of our grandchildren, each of the children here in the church, would feel like a beloved little soul. This is why, by the way, it's important to bring our kids to church. You know, soccer is important. Believe me, I know I played soccer for the first time in four months yesterday. It's very important. <laughs> but it's not nearly everything about who we are. You know, the, the life of the mind is important. You know, what we learn, you know, all the opportunities we have to learn, important. If that does not tell us everything about who we are. Everyone needs someone in life to tell them, you are a beloved soul. You are a soul. There is more to you than can be seen. There is more to you than can be touched. There is more to you than can be measured or counted or evaluated. You are a beloved soul. And where else are our children going to hear that? You're good at that here. About letting one another's children know that each of them is a beloved soul. And that's really what we want to create as a church, is that it's a place for grace where everyone who comes here, a child of any age, find themselves here to be affirmed as a beloved soul. So it's not just children that need to hear this. So I'd encourage you this week to think about, well, who is it? Who is it that I could bless? <coughs> who is it that I could somehow impart that message, perhaps not in the same way, by praying in Hebrew and lighting candles and placing your hand on their head, but who is it to whom you could communicate you loved soul. Rachel Raymond, the writer of this book, had a lot to do with training doctors. And after, uh, after one of the, the presentations or seminars or classes that she taught uh, doctors in medical school, one of them told her, you know, I came to medical school, school to become a doctor. But now I just want to be a blessing. Still a doctor, but a whole different view of it. I'm just healing bodies, but to be a blessing. So next week I'm being installed as your pastor here. Um, and that makes me think about when, well, not when it started, but the first official service that I ever had like that, which is when I was ordained uh, to be a Presbyterian pastor, uh, which happened like 30 some years ago when I was just this young whippersnapper who thought he really knew what was going on and how to do things. Uh, so I want to tell you the story of uh, what happened to me then. Kathy and I went, just went to our very first church in western Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh to be associates on the staff of a church, but we went before we were ordained. So we had two months in on the job before we took a week off. We went first to California, to San Pedro, where Kathy's home church was, it was where she grew up. Uh, and she was ordained there, and then we went to Wheaton, Illinois, uh, one of the suburbs of Chicago where the church, my home church was, and I was ordained there. And then we came back to this church in Washington, Pennsylvania, and it was our very first day back. It was, it was Tuesday morning, we had just arrived back, and we happened to live in half of a house, uh, like an apartment, right across the parking lot from the church. We could walk 
to work every day. Does anyone walk to work in California? <laughs> My daughter does, actually. She's one of seven people in Los Angeles who walks to work. <laughs> so we're walking to work across the parking lot, and right outside the, the door of the church is a big truck, like a U-Haul truck. And these really old guys, who are probably like not that much older than me, but these retired gentlemen were loading the truck with these big boxes, boxes of clothing. So we came over and we're talking to them, what are you doing? Well, we're loading this, we've been collecting clothing for a couple months, and we're loading it into this truck, and we're driving down to Cow Creek, Kentucky, yes, there is a place, Cow Creek, Kentucky, where the Reverend Joe Powis was for years, and he had a community center in this rural mountain Appalachian community in Kentucky where kids did not have much to wear, and all the you know, t-shirts and tennis shoes and all kinds of things went down to Cow Creek, Kentucky to be distributed to the people there who didn't have much. So the men are loading the sign, and we're talking to them and walking, uh, you know, there are about five of them, and, and uh, you know, help with a couple boxes. And, and then one of them, Tom, this wonderful gentleman, great, great heart, great soul, uh, he came over and he said, you know, well, Reverend, you know, well, it's the first time I've been called Reverend. He said, Reverend, how about, how about you bless the trip? Now, in my defense, in my defense, Tom had suffered a stroke a few years before. And so, so whenever he talked, he had sort of a laugh. And, and, you know, one side of his mouth didn't move. So when he said that, how about if you blessed the trip and had a little bit of a laugh? Well, I got, this is what I said. I said, oh, sure, bless the trip. <laughs> Smiled, walked on. And he just tapped a wonderful soul. He just sort of looked at me. Not with judgment, just with curiosity or puzzlement, something. And fortunately, my spider senses were tingling. The younger members of the audience know how that works. And I realized, I think you missed this one. <laughs> so I went over to Tom and said, Tom, you wanted me to, to uh, bless your trip, didn't you? He said, well, yeah, I sort of thought maybe you could say a prayer. <laughs> Let's say a prayer. <laughs> So Tom says, oh, come on, guys, Reverend's going to say a prayer. So we gather around, and we're about to say a prayer, and Carl, another wonderful gentleman, says, wait, wait, let's all lay hands on the truck. <laughs> so at that point, it's like, whatever you guys want to do is fine. Let's lay hands on the truck. So we all come over, we put our hands on the hood of the truck, and I said some, some prayer to bless their trip. Off they went, and I walked into the church, and I said, well, this is why I was ordained? I was ordained to lay hands on a truck? <laughs> and of course, as I thought about it, it was, yes, that's exactly right. You were ordained to lay hands on a truck. You were ordained to bless these men who were taking three days of their life to drive to this this hidden place in Kentucky to take take these these boxes of clothing that the people there needed to make a difference for some kids who didn't have tennis shoes or t-shirts. That's exactly why you were named. To bless people. To let them know that they are precious souls. And that what they were doing was letting others know that they also are precious souls. It's exactly, it's exactly what I was ordained to do. You know, ordained just means set apart for a particular, particular service, a particular task, that's all. And the truth is, all of you are ordained in your baptism. All of you are set apart to be God's person. All of you are set apart to bless, to bless others. To let them know that there's always a welcome home. To let them know that their worth does not depend on, on their net worth. To let them know that they are a precious, beloved soul. Pray with me. 
Oh Lord, this day, this week, open our eyes to those whom you will place before us. Perhaps those closest to us. Perhaps those with whom we work, with whom we play, with whom we study. Perhaps those whose names we do not even know. So that somehow we may be your voice that speaks to them in some, in some mysterious way. You are a precious, beloved soul. For Christ's sake, for the world's sake, and for our own sakes, we ask it.